My name is Christine Reek, and like all of you, when I work with my clients, I'm managing change. And with change comes opportunity. So I, as Catherine mentioned, I am an independent financial advisor, a former board member of the El Dorado Community Foundation, and a member of the Plan Giving Committee for the full 20 years. It has been our pleasure to host this forum, and for many years we focused on the education of how to talk to your clients about philanthropy and giving. And all of you are doing that, and the proof is how dramatically the El Dorado Community Foundation has grown over the past 20 years and the impact that giving has had in our community. And so I want to share and thank you because many of those referrals have come from the financial professionals and that's all of you. So on behalf of the El Dorado Community Foundation, I want to say thank you. So my presentation today is going to be a reminder as to why donors give. And I'd like to begin by sharing a short story that a client of mine sent to me just yesterday. And it was in the form of a joke, but as I reflected on it, I realized that it actually has a lot to do about what our panel is going to be speaking on today, and that's the unexpected when doing estate planning. And so I'll begin. Dave was a single guy living at home with his father and working in the family business. He knew that he would inherit a fortune once his sickly father died. Dave wanted two things, to learn how to invest his inheritance and to find a wife to share his good fortune. One evening at an investment meeting, he spotted the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. Her natural beauty took his breath away. I may look like an ordinary man, he said to her, but in a few years, my father will die and I'll inherit $20 million. Impressed, the woman obtained his business card. Two weeks later, she became his stepmother. <laughs> Again, the unexpected, but, but as all of us know, that's real. That is what we do. So what motivates an individual to give or to become a donor? All of you are donors in some way. As professionals, you give of your time, your talent, and your treasure. And you may be on a board involved in a legacy program, or you may have been touched personally that inspired you to give. And there are a lot of studies as to the who, when, and why people give. But the bottom line for most people is they were asked. Today I'm going to share a few um, slides here of those detailed reports. And they're just talking points as to things that we may want to touch on and remember as to how we all have an impact and why people give. And then I will end my presentation on a few examples as to recent local gifts that have made an impact on our community. So, to begin, critical moments are when people are managing change in their life. And all of you, if you're a CPA, estate planning attorney, a realtor, uh, financial advisors, um, directors of boards, fundraisers, were all touched by these opportunities. So to go through a few and remind us all, 
One, of course, is when we're opening a new account or establishing a new account for an individual or a client, family. What comes up is, who's my beneficiary? And as we are moving more into our aging process, not everybody has heirs or they're not sure of their legacy. They may not have children. And so we have more and more conversations about what happens with my money or my legacy upon my passing. Buying and selling securities, those are appreciated assets. Even when we're rebalancing portfolios, there may be opportunities to say, you know, what do you do with appreciated properties? And life insurance, when that comes up for any of us, even estate planning, why someone bought life insurance, maybe mortgage insurance, there's no longer a need. And a client may have the opportunity to actually leave it to a charity of their choice. Um, selling a business, I had a wonderful opportunity to work with a client for over two years as they were negotiating the selling of their business working with their CPA, working with their estate planner as to what do we do once we uh, receive all of the millions of dollars in assets. And so this individual opened a donor advised fund for $500,000 and feels so good that she continues to give more and more. Actually is now on boards and has made that a part of her life. The one that I kind of smile about is selling real estate. How many of you have had someone come and say, I heard you're on the hospice board and I have some property that's worth $2 million and I'd love to gift it. And you get excited only to find out it was a gas station. Right? And also setting up an IRA um, with the required minimum distribution and the opportunities, they, what the government did not change is the opportunity beginning at age 70 and a half to be able to give $100,000 a year out of your IRA without it being taxable. And now many brokerage accounts actually issue checks on your IRA so you can write those out personally yourself. So then how do donors learn about giving and bequests? And one is through the charity and their marketing efforts. And that could be through their sponsored events, volunteer programs, um, even their annual reports. A big one, of course, is through their legal or financial advisor. And that's when they come to us and they share of the passing of a partner, or they're creating a trust. They may have a tax question, and hopefully it's after April 18th, 15th, or whatever it may be. And one, you know, for tax preparers, it, it's when we think about, well, what happens when I sell my business? And so I think if there's a way we can, even as financial advisors, circle them back to the tax advisor who didn't really have the time during the first three months of the year, but would be happy to partner with us and talk more about those opportunities. And then, how many have been involved in a capital campaign of some sort? And so, you've been part of where we make the list of those names that we're going to go hit on and ask. But in reality, that isn't where most of the gifts come from. It's helpful, but it's actually from the other um, resources. What, what we find is that those who make their first will or trust under the age of 40, it's often because they may not have children and they may realize like, oh, I've been at the dinner party and everyone's talking about how they're leaving money to their kids or setting up trusts. And 
what do I do if I don't have children and you know how do I get along with my nieces and nephews but the big piece is right here the core is that between the ages of a 40 and 60 when a lot of families start coming to us and talk about the opportunities of giving things away they they may have more than they need they may be selling the business and they're looking for you know what what do we do with our legacy and the age when they be make actually be making a bequest is um, right here. This 60% is right here. The 40 to the 65. And that's when a lot of individuals might be thinking about retiring, so they're coming in and talking to their financial advisor, looking at their retirement accounts, consolidating 401ks, and as they are learning more about being on a board at the same time and spending more time as a volunteer, giving becomes part of what they want to talk about. I think it's interesting that 18 to 34, with the GoFundMe that is happening, more people are learning about giving at a much younger age. And actually, uh, if you talk to that generation, they want to start giving at a much younger age. So as we um, move through this, you know, what, what um, motivates, again, and desire to support a charity really is about the impact stories. The stories that we hear when we see the news and what's happening not only in our world, but the Caldor fire, what happened here in our own neighborhoods, our own home, to our own friends, that moved us. And the other is the ultimate use of a gift. That could be, um, we were inspired to think about giving because of taxes or selling a business. But really when you look at who's here today, it's really right here. What motivates still is all of you talking to your clients about the opportunity and what I think so many of us have learned is that once they started giving and they feel good, you, you add a joy to their life. They really feel pride in being part of something. The, the um, affiliation with a, with a charity the greatest example I could share is the Women's Fund of El Dorado County. It just celebrated 15 years. So most of you here, um, a few men, but mainly women, um, have been members for that full 15 years. And in that short period of time, they have given away $1.4 million to local charities. And it's about becoming a member. You are a member with just $200 and you vote on the grants and you go to the galas and you hear the impact stories. And I know Bill Roby, our executive director, can share with you how many of our major gifts that we currently receive and legacy gifts have come from that member who started with just $200. Uh, with the Women's Fund. Also, you know, how many people have been served by hospice and so they naturally at some point may want to give back and they may want that to be, you know, part of their legacy. What I want to end with in this is why donors don't tell. The difference is they tell us because everybody in this room is working with a client and confidentiality is everything to the client. So in reality, where this is a statistic about why donors don't tell, they tell us, and that's why, again, I go back to saying the thank you of the impact that you all have made to the El Dorado Community Foundation and its growth. So with that, to share just a few examples, one big one 
is the big day of giving that just happened on May 5th. That was because of an ask. I, I don't know how many of us that did participate would have had we not been asked. And in that one day alone, which is only the Sacramento region, there was $13.4 million raised, 30,600 donors gave, and 718 organizations benefited just from that one day of giving. Another big one where the El Dorado Community Foundation kicked off the fund was the Caldor Fire. Most of the funds raised were from local individuals and we raised, you raised $4.1 million and already $2.5 million has been given to those in need. A statistic, another that I just learned, like we never stop learning, I had an individual who was a chaplain for Snow Line Hospice, chaplain for the sheriffs, and is giving up his time now working with veterans. And he shared with me that there are 58 counties in the state, and El Dorado County has more veterans, over 17,000 veterans here in El Dorado County. And now he donates his time working with veterans in issues that they may be having. And of course, the big ones that were local gifts, one that you may not know is the El Dorado Community Foundation, and their building was a gift of a local donor, as was the Boys and Girls Club was the kickoff, and then many of us here have helped contribute to the Boys and Girls Club. And I don't want to forget Marshall Hospital because I'm on their board and we have the fundraiser here with us today. <laughs> but Marshall Hospital is a local community hospital that has greatly benefited from the, the charitable gifts from our community. So with that, again, why do donors give? A big reason is because of all of you. So now I'm going to turn it off over to uh, Bill, Bill, Bill uh, partner, <laughs> Bill Roby, my other partner and director. Thanks, Chris. So unlike Chris, I tend to wander, so I'm going to move around a little bit. Uh, Chris alluded to the work the foundation did on the Caldor Fire, and that was on October 14th, and I think it was about the 16th uh, of August, August 14th, uh, that the fire broke out. Um, it was uh, 16th of August when the fire ripped through Grizzly Flat and took out about 475 homes and leveled that community. And the foundation kicked in our work about two days into the fire and started distributing funds, emergency financial relief, to people in the community that were evacuated. Uh, because we know that a lot of the people in our community in El Dorado County cannot survive through an emergency of $400 or more. So this lifeline of providing financial assistance was critically important. Fortunately, we were ready for it as a foundation. We had built a community disaster fund to respond. Uh, what was interesting to me during the early days of the fire was how all the funding occurred. So as the fire is progressing and Grizzly Flat is being taken out, the funding that was coming into the foundation was coming very locally. And then it went on to Sacramento um, and Bay Area news stations, and we started to see regional funding. And then the moment it crested Echo Summit and went on national news that Lake Tahoe was threatened, that is when the national funding and large foundations started to give. And today they're still giving. So we're very fortunate that we've been able to help assist people. Um, and I'm looking forward to a summer of no fires because I don't want to go through that again. That was, that was a heavy lift for, for all of us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how philanthropy is changing 
Um, and as a foundation, we are really noticing that within the, our field, how philanthropy is changing. Um, in California, we have the League of California Community Foundations. It represents every foundation for very small ones to Silicon Valley who, uh, Community Foundation, which I think has about 16 billion in assets. Um, so we look back uh, in 2020, we had the pandemic. And then if that wasn't enough, we had a global supply issue. We also had in there the Caldar fire. Uh, and then in 2022, we had pandemic, global supply, Ukraine war, and inflation. So, you know, what more can we add into that? The year 2020, we saw large donors start to decolonize their wealth. And what that means to, to me as a director of a foundation is, in the past, we've seen donors give restricted funding. So they'll give to a foundation or a charitable entity and say how they want those funds to be spent. And we're starting to see donors just make contributions. And there's a reason why they're doing that. And the reason why is because they're starting to build trust. So there's a real trust issue in the community um, across the nation. But with, with charitable entities, with nonprofits, we seem to occupy this sweet spot of trust with donors. So we're seeing more and more estate plans come to the foundation that are unrestricted. Now they may designate a certain charity that they would like to see the funds go to, but they're not saying how the funds need to be utilized. There was an interesting example of this that came up with something that Chris alluded to, which is the Boys and Girls Club in Placerville. And it was primarily funded by one donor, and the donor wanted to assure that that building would stay with the Boys and Girls Club in perpetuity. So the donor did something very clever. The donor provided the funding with, along with many other donors, to build the building. But the donor ceded the land to the Eldorado Community Foundation. So the foundation owns the land. The building is owned by the Boys and Girls Club. So a future Boys and Girls Club board would never be able to sell the property. And that was the intent of the donor. And so that is really built by trust. The, the, it, this individual donor and the board of the Boys and Girls Club had trust in the Eldorado Community Foundation that we will be here in perpetuity and we will, be a hold, we will hold on to that asset. Uh, foundations are showing strong uh, and, and deployed in for grant making and setting up uh, cross-sector uh, collaborations. An example of that was the Caldor Fire. I've never worked with Cal OES or FEMA, and I hope to never again. Um, but don't tell them that. And if there's somebody from Cal OES here, I'm sorry. Uh, you'd be great. Uh, the, uh, what was interesting is, is watching how different sectors don't communicate with each other. Uh, from a foundation perspective, we're very used to working with the nonprofit sector, so collaboration is a part of what we do. And working with government entities, we saw totally the opposite. The reports that came out on the Caldor Fire from Cal OES did not match the reports from FEMA. And then the whole system of how they talk was not working. So we find ourselves interjecting ourselves into that process as a foundation to help actually the survivors of the fire so they can receive the assistance that they needed. Uh, something that stark to me was how many homes were destroyed or how many homes were uninsured. And there was, uh, in Cal OES's assessment, it was 30% of the homes were under, not insured and FEMA's assessment was that 60% were not insured. Um, what we're looking at now, what, seven, eight months out of the fire, is probably about 40% of that community of Grizzly Flat will return and rebuild, uh, which is very typical now of fires in the California foothills. Donors are understanding excellence is expensive. And this has been a, a key phrase of mine for many years now, is excellence is expensive. And if we want excellent outcome from our nonprofit sectors, we have to be able to provide 
the capacity for them to be at a level of excellence. So the foundation just completed this last uh, cycle of building a better nonprofit for our nonprofits, where we took them through five courses of uh, management, uh, governance, accounting, teaching them uh, cost accounting principles. A lot of nonprofits, when they receive a check, it goes into the checking account and they spend it and they don't understand that this is really cost accounting and you have to allocate it to however the donor wanted the funds to be spent. So going through that, that process, we had 75 nonprofits attend all five sessions on the Western Slope. And I believe Hillary was 30 in South Lake Tahoe. Mm -hmm. And the prize at the end of the schooling is we are going to be doing capacity building grants this spring for the nonprofits. So we're going to take a couple of the nonprofits and provide them over the next two years $100,000 to build their internal capacity. Because if we continue to fund nonprofits at a mediocre level, guess what kind of outcomes we're going to receive in the community? They're going to be mediocre. And if we build it up to a level of excellence, we're going to start seeing some excellent outcomes from our nonprofits. So that's not just for other nonprofits, but it's for the El Dorado Community Foundation as well. So this last year, we hired Avis Jolly as our impact officer. And that is to go out and quantify every single dollar that we put out in the community and help the nonprofit sector be able to achieve those goals and objectives that they laid out in their grant request. Philanthropy and government have always shared a goal to advance public good. Um, that dynamic is really starting to change. We're finding as a foundation that we are pivoting to other sectors. And that is that we're really good at grant making and the state of California and the county of El Dorado starting to recognize that and use this as a contractor. So we have done this with small business granting. I believe we granted out $5 million to the small business communities, uh, community of El Dorado County in 2020. Uh, right after there was a mandatory shutdown, the uh, state of California received grant money from the federal government and we ended up passing five million of that back through the small business community. And we did it very successfully in a very short period of time. So we're starting to have a different relationship as a foundation with the government. Um, and so much so that I seem to be on everybody's speed dial uh, with the Board of Supervisors. I'll tell you, that's not necessarily a good thing. And if there's any supervisors here, I sincerely apologize. Uh, it's okay, you can call me. Um, the creation of uh, uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, CZI, in 2015, as a charitable LLC was really a, a turning point. So we have a for-profit entity that is funding nonprofits. And CZI is a, a really interesting entity. Uh, you really don't know much about them or able to get through the door of entry to be able to interface with them. It's very, very difficult. You have to wait to be invited. And our invitation was the Calder Fire. So there was one night at home, 8 o'clock in the evening. My phone rings. This is well into the fire, probably two and a half weeks. Uh, it says, restricted on my phone. I have no idea where this phone call is coming. I'm tired. It's been a long day. Pick up the phone. There was a, a gentleman on the other line. He said, is this William Roby? I said, yes. He said, hold the line, please. And a voice came on and said, I'm Mark Zuckerberg. And I said, yeah, right. <laughs> and I was like, really, who is this? Is, so I, I have a friend of the bear, Scott. I was like, Scott, I'm tired. And he was like, no, this is Mark Zuckerberg. And um, I sat down. Uh, so. Uh, CZI did fund us uh, through the Caldor Fire, and now that funding door is open, and it's, it's interesting that once you're in, they want to stay engaged with you. Um, and they're doing some very active work with us on, um, 
uh, conservation and recovery uh, up on the top of the Sierra, especially around Echo, and uh, hopefully we're going to be engaging them in the recovery of Sierra at Tahoe. So we're also starting to act more business-like. I think that is something that there is a TED Talk that happened back in 2013, and it's a foundation we were ahead of that. And that was the reason why we acquired the building on Main Street in Placerville, because we needed to create different uh, avenues of revenue stream for our operations. By acquiring a building, we have now have a number of tenants they paying us leases. Uh, fortunately, most of our leases are five and ten year leases. Um, I don't know if they just felt guilty or uh, just appreciative of being in the building. But we have great tenants, but it creates a funding stream for us to diversify how we bring in our operating costs. And so we started to talk to other nonprofits and challenge them to think, what is it that you do that you can make a profit of? How can you monetize what you do? And a lot of nonprofits don't think of, of themselves as a business. And we're starting to see that change. And that is going to really impact, I, I think, the nonprofit sector in the next 10 years. We're going to see more and more nonprofits figuring out how to monetize their operation. Um, then we, we're going to talk about millennials and Generation Z who are really embracing this idea of nonprofits. Uh, monetizing their operation and thinking of themselves as a business because that generation is different than my mom and dad. My mom and dad gave. They were givers. So if somebody called, they would write a check and send off the money. Millenniums and Generation Z, my nephews and nieces, are interested in investing. They're not giving, they are investing. And Understanding that, we have a totally different approach to this generation that's coming forward. They want to know what the outcome is. What was achieved by their donation. And so as a foundation, we're starting to look at our donors, not just as donors, but investors. So we have an event coming up this fall where I'm looking at it as a shareholder meeting. Our donors are coming in, and we're going to treat them like they're shareholders. And we're going to report out on what we're doing. And this is really what the younger investors are looking at, is more accountability and more understanding of their investments. And the chronicle of philanthropy is uh, we must find and learn from cases when this has worked. Um, and it really has worked for us as a foundation. So it, it, it's an example of being able to take a, a really good business model and build on it incrementally. And we have built on it. We have grown since 2007 from a foundation of six million to we have just crossed over 30 million. So, which is phenomenal growth. We're growing like three to four million dollars a year now. That doesn't happen overnight. That took years and years of us planting seeds to get to this place. The percentage of Americans who say they're uh, giving to charity, according to the Chronicle of Philanthropy, is declining. However, our growth is accelerating as a foundation. Most community foundations, it's interesting, F F FSG did a research study uh, for uh, the Council of Foundations, which is the national organization that we're affiliated with and accredited by. Uh, so that was my plug for we're accredited. Um, and it's not an easy process to go through. I'm very proud that we're accredited. But they are seeing a decline in philanthropy. And, but the study that FSG did was they looked at the smaller community foundations and found that once you hit about the 20 million mark, you really start to rapidly grow. And you keep growing to around 120 million. And then there is a, a quiet more growth that happens after that. So we are growing substantially quicker than other community foundations. Uh, the next gen uh, is trans. Uh, yeah, the next gen is going to transform how we look at philanthropy. 
um, all across the board. The, to try to look into that crystal ball and to figure out what that's going to look like, I think it is would be challenging. They're blurring the sectors and the boundaries of defining how uh, we look at philanthropy and what doing good means. Um, we have so many challenges in society and how we approach those. We're looking at more creative designs, more creative ways to, um, to engage them, to accomplish them, and to succeed. And I think that next generation is, especially with technology, we're going to be looking at some huge innovations, not only in our communities, but in philanthropy as well. They're going to, as I said, they're going to be influencing everyone and everything. I wonder if that's a good thing. So I'm not sure. Um, so before we go to our 10 minute break, we're going to do a quick tail exercise. So in your packet, uh, you have two packets of dollars. Uh, so they're $100 bills. And then on your table, you have a series of buckets. So I would like you to take your money and just put it in the bucket that you think would be the best for your investment. So the buckets are art and culture, human basic need, community project, environment, children and youth, animal welfare, education, scholarships, health and wellness, seniors and vets. So whatever you think you want to give your money to, go ahead and put it into that bucket. You can put all your money into one bucket. Just one packet. Just one of the packets. Just open one of them. Don't use both. Janice spent all of her money. <laughs> Okay, I think we had a little confusion, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this I'm gonna bring this back real quick and make it easy on everybody. So I'm gonna skip ahead. Lois, I'm gonna not have a tally, I'm gonna go skip ahead of that. So what I wanted to demonstrate in this exercise is the value, what value a community foundation brings to the table. So by asking you to distribute that first bucket of, of that first packet of funding into these buckets, you did so according to your passion, or to, according to what you thought was the most important need. And that's what we tend to do as donors. We go in and we give to something that we're aligned to. This table over here is still working on it. <laughs> you guys done? No. Now you don't get any more money. Now you can't take this money out of here. I am not going to jail. So, I know, it looks good. When I saw it, I thought, that's scary. Um, so as, as donors, we give to the things that we're passionate about and the things that we care about. But it is that really the way we should be giving. So if you put your money in environment, are you aware that there's resource conservation districts throughout El Dorado County? There are also in El Dorado County two conservancies. There's the Sierra Nevada Conservancy and the Tahoe Conservancy. These receive enormous amount of state funding. There is also 8% of every rafting trip in El Dorado County goes to the environment in El Dorado County. So you think of all the rafters that are going down the South Fork. They are contributing 8% to the environment. If you chose health and wellness, did you know that in El Dorado County there's the El Dorado Community Health Clinic? that serves according to a sliding scale fee, and they also do prescription services, they have behavioral health therapists, they have doctors, they also have uh, many other services that are available, and most of it is, is free, uh, as well as the Miwok Community Health Clinic, uh, uh, that's along Highway 50. Uh, 
There's also, did you know, in El Dorado County that there's no mental health or alcohol or drug acute care in facility in El Dorado County. All of those services are, are delivered in Sacramento County. So the county is paying for people to go to Sacramento for treatment services because we don't have anything here. So we don't have an alcohol and drug outpatient uh, program or inpatient program or mental health. And 33.5% of the state revenue goes to more to Medi-Cal, supporting Medi-Cal. For seniors and veterans, there's the Older Adult Act of 1965. We have huge senior services in El Dorado County, from uh, doing legal services to providing in-home care. There's multiple organizations that provide that, that are for-profit, that are not nonprofit oriented. But the county also provides senior daycare and senior facilities as well, as far as uh, recreational activities. And for veterans, the veterans in El Dorado County receive TOT funding, transportation and occupancy tax. And they receive a large amount of that every year. And then we also have the Mather services, which are right down Highway 50. So there's a lot of services for uh, veterans and for seniors in El Dorado County that already exists. For education and scholarship, uh, California in 2021 spent $14,174 per student. That is only $940 below the national average. And 21% of the state tax revenue goes to schools. So schools are doing relatively well. Um, there's a, a, almost all the schools have a parent-teacher organization that also supports the other extracurricular activities within the school. And in 2022, I'm looking back at Avis because she's gonna know this for sure. Uh, the foundation awarded $90,000 in scholarships. Higher. Higher. 98? 105,000 dollars. 105,000 in scholarships. Um, and that is a conversation that we're also having with donors. And this exercise is to demonstrate why and how a foundation as assist your clients in knowledgeable giving. This is information we know about. And so when individuals come to the foundation and are wondering where to give their money and how it can be utilized, this is information that we're providing them. And we're also providing them, especially around scholarships, that you may not necessarily want to front load your scholarship. Now, normally, scholarships are given to graduating seniors, right? And 41% of uh, freshmen that go to college do not return for their second year. So is that really a good investment? Or would it be better to incentivize them to come back for their sophomore year and give them a grant their sophomore year a scholarship, sophomore year, and also their junior year and to complete and graduate? So that is a conversation we have with donors. Uh, in children and youth, uh, there's the McKinney-Vento Act that provides services uh, through the, the El Dorado Office, uh, County Office of Education for youth that may be coming from a situation of poverty. So every school district in the state of California has McKinney-Vento officers that supply financial services and other services to children. Uh, most youth programs come with compensation per child. I, I bet not everybody knows that. So you'll see a lot of programs for youth that also involve uh, lunch or maybe a late or early dinner. That's because that's compensated by the federal government. So that's passive income that comes back to the organization to support their operations. Uh, there's also daycare uh, subsidies and disability care. So more mother led rehabilitation serves a large population here in El Dorado County of disabled individuals. And the state of California pays, I think it's about 2,400 per individual that it goes to more on a monthly basis. Animal welfare, uh, if you're a financial planner or um, a real, a, uh, an estate planner, I just want you to know that 
the El Dorado Community Foundation has enough uh, safe plans in place for us to spay and neuter every animal within a five county area. <laughs> so when it comes to spay and neutering and you have a client that wants to do that, uh, I think we can help them find another thing that they can do with animals uh, than spay and neuter. I think we're good there. Uh, basic needs, health and human services in the county. It has a full wraparound process. There are two food banks in El Dorado County. The county just passed two weeks ago an emergency, emergency housing um, uh, resolution and that will release uh, close to $10 million to build a shelter, uh, if not one, two here on the Western Slope, and a navigation center for the homeless so that you'll, they'll be able to not only be housed, but they'll be directed to a navigation center to transition to affordable housing. And Don Ashton, who is the CAO of the county, called me yesterday, asked to meet if he, he asked yesterday if he could meet with me tomorrow to talk about affordable housing, because we all know there's no affordable housing in El Dorado County, so I can't wait for that conversation. Um, and there's also Section 8 housing, which is in El Dorado County, but very full and impacted. Community projects, um, there's lots of those that come to the foundation. Uh, they tend to be one-off projects, special projects. And then there's arts and culture. And there's about this much funding that comes from state and federal on arts and culture to El Dorado County. If we were in Sacramento, we would see our, the spectrum of giving totally flip. In more rural envir environments, it's the basic needs that are the most critical component. And when you go to a, a foundation in an urban setting, what you see is art and culture rises to the top. And so it just shows where we, where we are at as communities is we are driving our philanthropy towards the most critical need. Um, and, and that here in El Dorado County is usually around the basic need of individuals in this community. As I said, that was really demonstrated to us in the Calder Fire. At 1.55,000 people in El Dorado County were evacuated. And most of those people could not afford a $400 emergency. And that's why it became so critical to do the work that we did in supplying that financial aid. And I want to reach out and thank California Fire Foundation because they were phenomenal in providing uh, $750,000. And Avis is, Avis is nodding, so I'm not giving it close. Um, but again, um, I hope we don't have another fire this year because that was an unbelievable experience. And I now understand what other communities have had to go through. Um, any questions? Yep. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, after the fire, uh, so after you go through that initial process of recovery, um, now you're trying to go into rebuild. And part of that rebuilding process it, you, is, has been formulated around what's called a long-term recovery group. And there are 35 different agencies that belong to that recovery group. They've hired two disaster case managers to be able to run through these about 450 families that are gonna need disaster case management. And then from there, they will seek funding for those individual families. And the way that they're gonna do it is in two sectors. There's gonna be a $5,000 limit and things above 5,000. So if it's below 5,000, they'll come directly to the foundation and ask for funding. If it's above 5,000, it will go to a funder's round table. So the foundation will be there, United Presbyterian, Salvation Army, Christian Charity, Catholic Charity, uh, Cal OES, eh, don't know, uh, FEMA, no. Uh, so yeah, Calder Fire didn't receive the individual assistance declaration. Uh, 
and it was really hard trying to get an answer out of FEMA why. And as close as I got was there was a lot of vacation homes that were burned, and they they felt that really didn't equate to um, yeah allocating the individual assistance. But they wouldn't say that, or they wouldn't put that on paper. Yeah, uh, but I I was put on a non-recorded call for that conversation. I'm sure. Uh, but so the allocation that we still have, the reserve that we still have, is going to be used to make, meet these further needs. It, part of the fire when when people were removed, that they then the next step was signing what was called a uh, release to enter. So that was to allow the state of California to go in to remove the debris, uh, which is a cost of about seventy thousand dollars per site, and then the site is released back to the homeowner. And then the homeowners are now in the process of figuring out, do I want to rebuild? And if I'm going to rebuild, I have trees that have to be cut down, and I also have to have erosion control, and that's where our funding will come in to do those things. There's a lot of trees that are marked for removal by PG&E and Cal OES uh, that are along power lines and right of entry, but anything off of that has to come from the individual. And if you go up to Grizzly Flat, all you see is, well, the same at Echo, just black sticks everywhere. So the rest of the reserve that we have is going to be going to meet that need. Yep. Now we were delivering water at one point. I never thought foundation would be in the water business, but yeah. I was going to say, in addition to the individuals, um, I know we're holding some too. For the infrastructure stuff that Bill just mentioned, for instance, the school, um, we know that they are going to plan to rebuild Walt Tyler. They've been working on getting architecture plans. But as far as the contents of the school, the books and the library and things like that, that isn't going to be covered. So that's where these funds they come into play, some of these infrastructure, bigger infrastructure things that serve an entire community. Yeah, we actually had that conversation with Pioneer uh, District and said once you rebuild Walt Tyler, does your insurance cover the books that were lost in the classroom? And they said, that's a good question. Um, and they came back and said, no. Wow. So we will provide them the finances to do that, to put back the books in the library. No. Any other questions? Do you want to give money to me now? <laughs> I got a thousand bucks here. <laughs> So just Andy, we're going to go to a break now for you, but if you ever have a client that's in your office and you're shy about asking, call me. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to take a 10 minute break. It's great to see so many of you again, honestly. Uh, I was looking around the room and realizing a whole lot of you I haven't seen for at least two and a half or three years, and it's great to see you again. So today we're going to be talking about principal and income, and no, this is not a new topic, but it is a topic that's critically important when you get into administration of a trust and uh, the taxation of a trust. And uh, I, I know that, like for me, probably every week I get a call from a client that has some kind of question that impacts or that it has to do with principal and income. Uh, you know, it might be a surviving spouse who has either a Q-tip or a bypass trust and has the deceased spouse's children looking over their shoulder trying to figure out if they're spending the money correctly or distributing correctly. And the question to me is, well, okay, what am I entitled to? What can I take? Um, or it could be an income beneficiary who comes and wants to know how can I invest so that I can increase my income because the income that I'm getting is not enough to live on. Or it might be a trustee that wants to know if I distributed all the income, why is there income tax at the trust level? So these are all issues having to do with, trust, uh, with uh, income and principal and we'll be tackling those today. What we're going to do is spend a little bit of time going through the basics of what for trust purposes is income, what is going to uh, be principal, how you figure it out. Then we're going to talk about uh, some options if you have a situation where when you follow the rules, 
and you can't uh, where it's not going to be equitable among the beneficiaries and and some of the options for dealing with that uh, then we'll get to tax issues I should say then Dan will get to tax issues <laughs> and and then we'll wrap up with some examples uh, to go through that illustrate the issues we've talked about okay let's see here if I can do all this oh this is us Okay, so principal and income, uh, like I said, it's very important for administration and tax purposes. Your trust documents are going to address both things. Um, if you look in the part of the trust that talks about the distributions, commonly there's going to be a paragraph that says what happens with the income and another paragraph that says what happens with the principal. Then, if you're going to look at defini for definitions of principal and income, you're going to have to look in what you probably think of as the boilerplate part of the trust, the administrative provisions, and pretty often there's going to be a provision there that says um, how, what, what is principal and income. Now, it may just refer back to the statute, but that's where you're going to find the provision. Um, Really, you need to take a look because honestly, without knowing what it is, how it's defined under the trust or knowing the rules under the statute, you're not going to know what distributions you can make. And you're also not going to know how to allocate the expenses um, and the, uh, who it is who's going to be responsible for the taxes. So it is very important to know this. When does it come up? Well, I'm not talking about uh, situations where what you have is a revocable living trust with the settlor is still alive. This is what we're dealing with here is uh, an irrevocable trust when you've got one person who has an income interest and then you have a, a principal interest. It may be the same person who currently has it, but then you're going to have remainder beneficiaries. Uh, so you, you have these two kind of competing interests, the income interest and the principal interest. Uh, the most common examples of where this shows up uh, with surviving spouses. Uh, it's very common there that what you've got is a, a trust. It may be a Q-tip. It may be a bypass trust. Um, often they provide mandatory income for life. If, if it's a Q-tip, it has to be mandatory. Uh, or it could be a standard that, uh, uh, if it's not a Q-tip, it could be uh, uh, as much income as needed for health support maintenance. Uh, the principal uh, may be tied to a standard. They may have access to principal. They may have limited access to principal. Uh, most commonly, you'll see that they have access for health support and maintenance. Uh, but there may also be a provision that says, first you got to look at what other assets they have or maybe even that says you've got to use all of the assets in the survivor's trust before you get to the bypass or the exemption. Uh, and then, most commonly, the remainders to children could be something else. Uh, the, other kind of, the other place this really comes up often is in trust for children, and I'm having this happen more and more where parents come to me and they want to leave their, their assets to their kids, but they're worried. They're worried either that the child themselves is not going to be good with money, or they're worried that the child is married to someone they don't trust with their money. Uh, and so they want to hold the assets in trust for a period of time. And there again, usually you're going to have income uh, to the child, either for a number of years or for life, and then uh, uh, the remainder usually to their children. Um, that's probably enough on that. Okay, now this is probably the biggest takeaway uh, we want you to have from this program, which is that most of us feel like we know what income is, because we all pay taxes, right? So we know basically what, what is income for tax purposes. But trust income is different. Income for trust purposes is not the same as taxable income, or as I say it, income for income tax purposes. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, Silly, you want to take a word? This is the... I just want to make a point. Uh, for those of you who don't draft trust documents every day, it, the, the, the language we use in connection with trust can be misleading. A lot of you might think, well, you know, I just pulled this off the, out of the cabinet. This is my trust. No, this could be the trust document. Trust is a fiduciary relationship. Trustee manages the property for beneficiaries. 
Probate Code Section 16,000 says, trustee manage the assets in accordance with the trust document, or if it's silent regarding something, then follow the probate code. So what we're talking about almost always can be drafted around. You can, we're talking about default rules. The other thing is what's critical, not just, not just income taxes, but when we're doing the income and principal distinction, it's beneficiaries we worry about. Lawyers advising trustees worry about beneficiaries. And, and you might think, well, I've got surviving spouse and the kids, remainder beneficiaries, I've got all the beneficiaries in front of me. No, the probate code, section 24, says beneficiaries include contingent beneficiaries. You can have even unborn, unascertained beneficiaries. In many cases, you have to go to court and get a guardian that might have appointed to represent them. So when we're thinking about the interests of beneficiaries, think broadly. Okay, so, so when the question comes about what is income, what is trust income, the first thing you have to do is look to the trust, because what the code says is it's whatever the trust says it is. So again, that's where you go look and be sure and check uh, in the administrative provisions to see if there's a provision there, and I'll show you a couple of them there in a minute. Um, if the trust has a provision, it controls, even if, it's, it, it, even if it contradicts what the statute says. Um, the next thing that comes up is some trusts have a provision that basically says that um, the trustee has discretion to determine what is principal and what is income. Well, on the face of it, that sounds pretty cool because that just means the trustee gets to decide and, you know, it sounds pretty flexible. But if you've got that kind of a provision, uh, you go to the rules about exercise of discretion by a trustee. And uh, uh, what the primary rule there is that the trustee is going to have to exercise a discretion in a way that is fair and reasonable for all beneficiaries. So even though they, even though they have full discretion to decide, they can't suddenly decide, oh, let's sell the house and I'll allocate all that income to, or all of that, all the proceeds to income, because that wouldn't be fair to all the beneficiaries. Um, and then third, to the extent that the um, uh, trust doesn't cover it, or if the trust is silent, then you go to the statute to see what is income and what is principal. Um, I just, because I wanted to see kind of what was out there, I did a random sampling of trusts in our office, because we always have the ones we prepare and then ones other people have prepared and brought to us for administration just to see what their uh, uh, principal and income provisions are. So I wanted to show you a few of those. The first one is what I thought most of them were going to be like, which is just basically saying, okay, unless we've said something else elsewhere in the body of this trust, just, just look at the statute. It just refers you back to that. So it doesn't go into any detail, it just refers you back to the statute. And this is, really is what I've seen most often. But then I did run across one of the trusts that had the full discretionary provision in it. Interesting thing there, if you just read this, uh, it gives the trustee full power and authority and absolute discretion, and it's binding on all, all people. So you think, wow, they can pretty much do whatever they want, but it still has to be fair and reasonable to everybody. And then there's this provision, and honestly, uh, when you run into a provision like this, you need to really pay attention. Uh, because here they've broken it down, and this is where you're going to see uh, if they've made any changes so that in that particular trust, you're going to have to allocate differently than the statute would allocate. And I, I was kind of surprised, uh, uh, but like in this one, they're requiring uh, reasonable reserves for certain types of assets, and some of that is allocated to income, which would ordinarily have been, not been that way. Uh, or if you look at D there, it says all distributions from mutual funds and similar entities of gains from the sale or other disposition of property shall be credited to principal. Well, that's actually a little different than the statute, because the statute does have a carve-out for some short-term gains uh, being allocated to income. So if you've got this in your trust, this trumps. So you need to know if it's there. Oops, oops, oops. Here you go. Okay, yeah, so I, I got ahead of myself. That's fine. Okay. 
So uh, again, the, the statute controls only if the trust document doesn't override it. So when we go to the, the, the applicable statute, 16, uh, 324 of the probate code, it basically is saying anything that's earned off of an asset, that's going to be income. And what's not shown on this slide is that what we're really talking about is net income. 16.328 basically says net your expenses against the income of the principal. We'll talk about that, but think about it in terms of a quadrant. Let's just say that you have $50,000 of principal uh, capital gains that are clearly allocated to principal, and you have $50,000 of other income, interest, dividends, rents, uh, that will be allocated to, to income, and you've got $10,000 of administrative expenses equally split between the two, a beneficiary is to get all income, at least annually, is going to get $45,000, not 50, because you allocate costs. And similarly, what does go into the increase in principal? $45,000. So that's why we, we have to look at it as a quadrant. Um, and basically, anything that gets sold, even if it's taxable income, is going to be allocated to principal. So as a general rule, your capital gains are going to be allocated to trust principal and not income, and they stay in the trust. So uh, there are various exceptions, and you can override. Again, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the adjustment power and the unit trust, which would, in effect, allow you to either allocate what would be principal to an income beneficiary or redefine income and principal for a certain purpose. But as a general rule, uh, the sale of assets generates uh, a principal increase and not income. So think about uh, things like, uh, let me just make sure I'm on the right one. Here. Okay, so for entities, the, the default rule is if you get a cash distribution from an entity, it's allocated to income. If you get a property distribution, typically it's allocated to principal, but then there are all sorts of exceptions, and there's no way we're going to sit here this afternoon and start going through this. I have the probate code, if anybody wants to go through it afterwards, great, but you're going to find that there are rules and exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions. This is an area where there's a lot of detail in the probate code. The, the distributions relating to entities would be one of those classic areas where there's a lot of detail. You can see these statutes that talk about that, and um, all I can say is it's complicated and there have even been cases that have caused revisions to the probate code in this area because it's been complicated. When it comes to rental property, we see that all the time. General rule will be your rents would be allocated to income. There's a special rule in the probate code that says that when you're dealing with businesses, you can treat them as separate, basically, units for trust accounting purposes and businesses can include rental businesses. So you might look at, uh, at an activity and say, oh, this is a rental business and I, I, I want to use the normal standard approach. If it's part of several businesses, you, you would account for them separately. Um, obligations such as uh, bank accounts, uh, bonds, general rule would be what you would expect. And that would be that, that if you've got earnings, you've got interest, uh, it's going to be considered a, a, an income receipt. And then if you've got principal uh, a recovery of capital, it'll be considered principal. And, and, and it's important here, for the most part, we're talking about the things that would show up on a trust accounting are receipts and disbursements, right? Receipts and disbursements. Those are the things that you see on a trust accounting. That's what we're talking about in terms of income and principal. Then there are various odds and ends. And this slide is here largely to show you that, that if you run into something, look in the probate code because it might well be covered. I mean, we've got we've got timber, which is relevant in this county. Uh, we've got mineral rights. We've got IRAs and and, and uh, you know, 401k distributions. General rule is that effectively 90% principal, 10% income. But you can have exceptions, and you can have situations where that is not the case. And so you essentially need to be doing your homework, reviewing the trust document, and looking at the circumstances. <laughs> and you've got special rules relating to insurance, for example. Okay, so, so what Syl was just talking about was the, the uh, receipts coming into the trust. Now we're gonna look at the expenses and how those are allocated. And honestly, this is where I think that it's not all intuitive. It's not necessarily what you think it's going to be. 
Um, the first section here is allocation of disbursements where we're talking about administrative expenses. And this is all of our fees. This is uh, attorney's fees, uh, uh, accounting fees, uh, and, and advisor fees. These are divided 50-50 between income and principal. Now this is kind of interesting because uh, that's not necessarily what people are going to expect. And if these things are deductible for tax purposes, uh, that, that deduction is going to also be divided between the, the uh, income beneficiary and the principal. So it, it may not be what people are expecting there. Um, also, from the standpoint of a beneficiary, it could be that they're assuming that, that whatever attorney's fees or advisor fees that they're paying comes out of the income they have actually received, and they may be paying for things that actually should have been paid for out of the principal. So it is something that you should be aware of. Same thing with accounting fees, they're 50-50. Uh, court fees are going to be that unless you're in court to decide whether something is income or principal. And then if you're in for that purpose, then it's allocated to the one that, the, that is the purpose of that action. Um, and other ordinary expenses of administration are, are for income. I didn't get a clicker back anymore. <laughs> Okay, so taxes, uh, uh, the allocation of those. Uh, estate taxes, transfer taxes, and penalties, and here by penalties I mean penalties on estate taxes and transfer taxes, not if you fail to file your income tax return. But the, the ones, uh, the estate taxes, taxes, transfer taxes, those are allocated to principal. Um, income taxes that are due on assets that are allocated to principal, including capital gain, are paid out of principal. So again, another place where the beneficiary may not be realizing that and may be paying uh, income taxes on capital gain uh, when that's actually from the principal. Um, property taxes, however, are going to be taxed to income. And that takes us to the next slide, which has to do with real property. And honestly, this is the one that, for me, was the most surprising in some ways. Now I think, and it helps me to, to think of it this way, so I'm sharing this. Um, I think the rules here come out of the idea of a life estate. You know, before we did things in trusts, uh, if, if a spouse was going to leave a house to another spouse, they might leave it to them for life with the remainder to somebody else. And when that happened, while it's in the life estate, all the expenses are paid by the life beneficiary. Uh, and then when it passes to the others, they pick up the expenses. So these rules kind of follow that. Uh, ordinary repairs, maintenance, property taxes, uh, all are paid out of income. Uh, when you, uh, if you have rental property and so you've got a property manager, that also comes out of income. And here's the one that's surprising to me. Extraordinary repairs and capital improvements also are out of income. Now, if you think about that, if you have a house, and often this is the case in a trust, maybe there's deferred maintenance, you need a new roof. Well, the, if that comes out of income, there might not be any income left to distribute to that income beneficiary that year. Now, one way to deal with that is you can borrow from principal, so pay for it from principal, but that is a loan, and you have to pay it back out of income. Um, now the one thing that is going to come out of principle here is if you're going to sell property, the expenses to prepare the property for sale are going to come out of principle because if you sell the property, uh, the proceeds are going to go to principle. Yeah, Chris had an example of donating a gas station, right? So what if that gas station has a, a cleanup, a super fun cleanup, right? And so is that part of, uh, does that come out of income? Is that part of, does that come out of the, uh, the principal component? So these are all important issues when you are funding trusts. What, what is the source of that funding? And what are the potential costs of the, to, the, to the trust for maintaining that property? Okay, and then if there's a mortgage, uh, it's, that is going to go, the principal, the portion of it that's principal is going to go, come from principal, the portion of it is, that is interest is going to go from income 
But if the loan is to improve the, the property, then it's all going to be income. So uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the adjustment power and the unit trust uh, provisions. Uh, show of hands, anybody dealt with the adjustment power? So I have never done that. I've never dealt with it. I, you know, I was just thinking about it, which is odd because I deal with a lot of trust administration. I draft many unit trust provisions. I've gone to court and did a unit trust where we didn't have any authority for it, but we basically had a floating unit trust between 3 and 5 percent, which as we'll discuss at the safe harbor, based on how prior performance worked. And I, and I think it's perfectly fine for tax and other purposes because we're within the safe harbor every year. Run into unit trust all the time. The adjustment power probably is just underused. Um, and, and so, you know, we've had circumstances where we've had a very low interest rate, low uh, income environment, high capital gains. Who knows whether that will continue based on what we're seeing in the markets. You, so, yep. you, sorry, just a question on that. Do you, uh, you have a theory for why it's underused? I don't. I, I think it may be, it may be that it's, it's just not known well enough. So, uh, and, and some background, a little bit on these. The, um, you know, Dan will talk about taxes, but, but the basic idea is, again, you can draft whatever the heck you want in your trust document, and there's some case law out there that essentially says for tax purposes, fiduciary income tax purposes, we're not going to let you, for example, say that, well, distributions will happen in any year in which we can reduce the tax rates, right? So, because, because distributions have to be proper under Section 661 of the Internal Revenue Code in order to carry out distributable net income that Dan will talk about, you have to comport with traditional notions of principal and income for tax purposes. So what happened is, the Treasury came out with some regulations talking about the adjustment power and the interest power, and how within these parameters it'll, be, it'll qualify, and it'll be a safe harbor. And so California then followed. One of my retired partners is the guy who drafted most of this as part of the committee that, that, that we were on at different times for the state bar, and then you present it to legislators. So, you know, this thing is designed, these rules followed the federal safe harbors. And so, what are your options? The two primary ones would be the unit trust uh, power or uh, the adjustment power unit trust. But you can also go to court and modify. I mean, there are ways you can modify a trust document, sometimes with or without beneficiary consent. Again, remember, beneficiaries very broadly defined. Uh, section 15409, if you have unanticipated circumstances, you can go to court and explain that. So you can modify your trust documents now in the trust law since 2019. I think we have trust decanting, uh, which is becoming more useful, although maybe not as much as it could be because of certain notice provisions. But a critical part of all this would be you have a duty of impartiality as a trustee to deal with beneficiaries impartially, again, broadly defined, and, and so as a trustee, you're trying to invest under the prudent investor rule. You're trying to invest for overall return, and you have a duty of impartiality. So traditionally, there was a good list and a bad list for trust investments. Now, anything's acceptable, but it needs to be part of a, a proper portfolio plan. And, and so what happens if you want to invest for overall return, and you want to have assets that are expected to appreciate a lot, but not kick off much income, how do you act impartially if you're the trustee. Well, you can allocate some principal to income through an adjustment power, or you can redefine what would be income and principal under a unit trust provision. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about. So let's first start with the adjustment power. Um, this is under Probate Code Section 16336, and this section does a lot of lifting because the unit trust statute, 13336.4, kind of refers to it and, 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 and requires that certain provisions of this statute be satisfied for that as well. So this is a circumstance where you have a trustee investing in a prudent investor rule. Uh, the trust document does not clearly preclude an adjustment and income is to be distributed to a beneficiary. So the trust document says distribute income at least annually or distribute income for health, education, maintenance, and support. It's basically an income rule trust. And there are limitations. The, the statute is designed to prevent you from blowing a Q-tip election or a charitable deduction election. There are things that are designed to prevent you from running astray. But outside that context, basically, the statute says 
If the trustee concludes that the trustee cannot be impartial to the beneficiaries in terms of administering the trust, then the trustee may, not obligated, but may adjust what would otherwise be principal and allocate it to income. And there's a, a variety of factors in the statute. So, you know, if you ever run into one of these things, you look at the statute. It's actually, I think, well written. It's fairly concise. And it'll give you the factors and it'll give you the limitations. You don't have to go to court and get approval. Certainly you could. And there's nothing that would preclude you from doing that, from filing a petition, you know, 17200 petition for instructions. But, but you don't have to. That's not the way the statute is designed. Um, and so I've got a, a, you know, basically an example of the adjustment power in the next slide where a trustee wants to invest in low yield securities with high appreciation potential and wants to be able to, as you'll indicate, see in the last bullet point, do two things, treat beneficiaries impartially and invest for overall return in, in, in accordance with prudent investor uh, limitation and, and requirement. Next, for the unit trust, I think the, this is more complicated. Again, I've drafted lots of these, the provisions get complicated, but essentially the statute says, look back to 16336, it's again the kind of situation where uh, beneficiaries to receive, it, receive income distributions, the trust document does not clearly prohibit a, a unit trust. Uh, the trustee concludes that the trustee cannot be impartial and still invest prudently. And now what the trustee can do is essentially redefine income. We've just gone through all these examples of what principal and income. Very simple, just multiply the asset values and the, it's essentially over, over a, a period. Uh, multiply it by a percentage, and the statute says 4%. There's another statute that says, under certain circumstances, you can deviate, and your range can be between 3 and 5%. Again, what that does is it, it, it links up with the, the federal regulations dealing with fiduciary income taxation. And so these are safe harbors. Could I draft a unit trust that says 10% per year? Absolutely. But I'd be outside the safe harbor. That would be my concern. You're on your own once you start doing that kind of thing. And so, again, these are fairly complicated, but they can work out really well. And so there's just a simple example on, on the next slide where you've got a million dollar estate and a 4% unit you trust, you're paying out $40,000 per year. Again, you, you would, you, you've got a, a much simpler calculation. This does not preclude you from also making distributions of principal under a hemp standard. Okay, the statute's clear about that. So. If you have a statute that says all income to X, at least annually, and as much principal as necessary for X's health, education, maintenance, and support, nothing says that a unit trust precludes you from making principal distributions, nothing at all. And so, what are the differences between the unit trust and the, and the uh, adjustment power? Well, the, the, the adjustment power is really intended to be temporary. I mean, there's some question as to whether you could just effectively have a, a provision that says we're going to adjust every year seen a memo running through our office by the guy who drafted uh, these things and it wasn't clear uh, but I would do it every year er, and, and evaluate separately all the factors every year if I were doing this and I surely will at some point be put in that position a unit trust is different it's permanent you can make changes you can revoke it you can change the percentages but it's designed to really be an amendment of the trust document and therefore the fiduciary relationship that that document governs Um, well, before I leave, I want to, want, want to mention a, a major limitation. On the adjustment power, the, the statute says that a beneficiary slash trustee cannot exercise the adjustment power. Where do you see that all the time? Surviving spouse is the beneficiary of a Q-tip trust or a bypass trust. The statute also says if you have co-trustees, the co-trustee can exercise that power. So that's useful. Uh, I would imagine it could be done with a trust protector as well. The statute says trustee. Trust protector is not clear in California whether they're really acting as trustees. They are acting as a fiduciary. But the unit trust provision does not have that limitation. So a surviving spouse could actually do a non-judicial uh, unit trust conversion on a Q-tip trust, for example. Or you can go to court. I mean, these, the, the unit trust can be judicial or non-judicial. So I think that, that is an important distinction as well. Uh, so I think, Jana, we're on to the next slides. Okay, uh, actually, Syl really covered these. Uh, this, is, this is the idea that, <clears throat> excuse me, 
if, if the adjustment power or the unit trust conversion is not going to be appropriate in your situation, uh, there still might be other ways to make changes to this trust to better accommodate what it is that uh, uh, needs to be done. Uh, and, but uh, one way is modification <clears throat> under the probate code. Uh, and the, the issue with both of these, uh, these statutes here with modification is that they're going to require going into court. They're going to require notice to all of the beneficiaries and in some case consent of the beneficiaries. If you have a situation where you've got cooperative beneficiaries, uh, that's not a problem. Uh, if, you're, if you're going in uh, in a, a situation where there's some acrimony, uh, this could be difficult to achieve. And um, you, the other thing is that these are really up to court discretion, so you're going to have to uh, present your case and explain why this makes it more fair and more fair to all beneficiaries for the court to go along with it. Uh, and then I did mention here decanting or a trust protector, but that's a whole other subject. Just know that they're out there as other possibilities. Uh, now we're moving on to tax. All right. All right, just a couple of comments about the, um, some of the issues that Syl and Jenna have raised about trust accounting, allocation between principal and income for both receipts and disbursements. Uh, you know, we do a number of trust accounting where it's similar to the example Chris gave, where you now have a new step-parent who is younger than the uh, step-kids, and the spouse passes away. And the kids are saying, well, we don't want the step-parent to get a dime more than they're entitled to, and the step-parent says what? The kids get nothing and like it, all right? So, <laughs> and so from those, we do a number of accountings for lots of businesses, et cetera, but the ones we do for trusts are the most highly scrutinized. The issue of allocating between principal and income for receipts and disbursements is poured over. And the income beneficiary is going to take, wants to take as much as possible, and the remainder beneficiary says, well, leave as much in there as you can, and then there's disagreements on how to invest and manage assets, and you guys have covered all this. So. Um, and for new clients that come in where maybe a surviving spouse is doing the trust accounting on their own, I find they usually take less than, than they're entitled to. And Janet kind of mentioned this, where they're allocating all the expenses against income, right, against interest and dividends, and forgetting about the fact that half the fiduciary fees, the accounting fees, and legal fees, those are borne by the remainder beneficiary. The income beneficiary doesn't have to reduce their share by that. So unless you've got a professional doing the accounting, often that gets, simply just gets missed, and they're taking less income than they, than they get. So. But I want to talk about the income tax side. So trusts are taxable entities, right? They pay their income, they pay income tax to the extent the trust has income. Uh, accumulate during that year. Now trusts pay at the exact same rates as individuals. It's the same scheme of 0% for certain capital gains up to, what's our highest federal rate again? It's, you guys are paying attention. Does anybody do their own returns? Or, <laughs> do they count any CPAs here? <laughs> it's 37%, all right? Uh, but you get to the 37, 37% rate by, for a trust at only 13,000 of income, all right? For individuals for married following joint, it's six hundred and twenty some odd thousand, or for single filers, it's five hundred thousand plus. So you can see the issue, right? You get to the highest rate of income with the trust at much lower levels. So we're always looking for opportunities to move income out of the trust to the beneficiaries where it makes sense. Now all the beneficiaries, income beneficiaries are in the highest tax bracket. They're all thirty-seven percent rates. Do we really care? Probably not, right? But in terms of a basic planning issue. Um, having the trust not pay the tax is typically more tax efficient. Or working with the investment advisors and making sure that the trust assets are being managed tax efficiently. Is it creating income unnecessarily? Is it creating headaches for all involved, depending on the needs of the income beneficiary and the remainder? So, so in the material, I've got a, um, uh, a, a very basic example of a simple trust where trusts get a deduction for income distributed, called the Income distribution deduction, it makes sense, right? It's the lesser of fiduciary accounting income. Again, back to the concepts that Chris, I mean, uh, Chris, that um, Janet and Sue are, are, are speaking of, and also how the tax laws affect that. Um, so in this basic example, we've got dividends of 100,000, real estate taxes for 20,000, legal fees of 2,500, uh, trustee fees for 5,000, and investment advisory fees. And the issue is, even though you may be paying out all the required income, the fiduciary accounting income, 
you still may have a tax trust level. This is because of some of the changes in the tax law uh, as of uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2013. I don't know how well you can see the example here, but um, so I've got some, uh, I've got a summary of that example. I've calculated the fiduciary accounting income, it's that middle column. Now we get an income distribution deduction for a trust with a lesser of the accounting income or, to, or the um, dist, or DNI or distributable net income. And since can we, are, are, is the deduction for taxes limited? Yeah, it's limited to ten thousand, right? And what about investment advisor fees? Can a trust deduct those for federal purposes? The answer is no. They're subject to two percent. They're, they're a two percent limited item. Two percent limited items are now non-deductible for federal purposes. So we've got a situation where we pay down all the income, we're required to with a simple trust, and we still have $18,000 of taxable income. At what rate do we pay tax on it? Well, for the last dollar of income, the marginal rate is 37%. We're paying tax at the highest rates, even though we've done nothing but follow the rules. Right? So is there, more, is there more efficient ways to managing income and deductions for this trust? Those are issues you've discussed with your attorney and your accountant. All right, so we've talked about um, principal and income receipts and disbursements. We've talked about the power to adjust between income and remainder beneficiaries or, in the, or income beneficiaries in the trust. But how do we tax capital gains? Well, the default for capital gains is that the trust pays a tax on capital gains. Right? And just like uh, the tax rates for individuals, the capital gains rates for trusts are also compressed. You're paying tax at the highest rate for a trust for capital gains that exceed 13750 And you're paying the net investment income tax, which is an additional 3.8%. You don't get to the net investment income tax until income is above 250 uh, for an individual, and you're not getting to the highest capital gains rates until you're above around 528000 So that's why allocating capital gains to income beneficiaries from a tax planning standpoint, it becomes important. But we, but we still have to manage the, uh, the needs, the obligations, the, um, uh, the, the uh, issues for both the income and remainder beneficiaries. So how do you allocate capital gains? Can you just simply do it? Right? Can you just walk in there and say, well, you know what, I think capital gains should be allocated. Well, if the trust allows for uh, the trustee to define income, then you have some flexibility. You can actually make them your own distinction or uh, decisions as trustee about how to allocate capital gains. But then Sill Sil and Jan have both brought the issue of the power to adjust. And it has to be done under a reasonable and impartial exercise of discretion by the fiduciary. So one method is to simply say, well, we're exercising our power to adjust. We're going to allocate capital gains to the income beneficiary. Right? That can work. Now, it seems to me as an accountant, that the um, uh, calling it an impartial and reasonable exercise as, as discretion, I don't know what that exactly means. I don't know. What, I, I kind of get the idea it was reasonable. I would def I would depend on Syl and Jana to explain to me if you're being reasonable or you're being unreasonable. But I don't know. It seems like you've got lots of opportunity here. Uh, the other opportunity is to allocate capital gains from the first year. If you're doing it from the first year consistently, then at least from tax from a tax standpoint, the IRS will respect that. Section 643. Now, that's still making sense for um, the income beneficiary and the remainders. That's another, that's another issue altogether. But as long as you're doing it from the first year, then you're okay. Now, there's certain events where capital gains can go to the income beneficiary uh, either at the termination of the trust or where we've got a trust set up where a portion is paid out to the beneficiary at the attainment of a certain age. <coughs> And usually the older the uh, settler of the trust, the older the child has to be before they think they're capable of handling money. Right? So the trust may say, well, half goes to the, the income beneficiary at age 35. Well, you know, as the parent is in their 70s, they go, well, I think it should be 45 or 55. Right? But if you've got capital gains at that event, where you're trying to meet that obligation to pay out to the uh, beneficiary a percentage of the trust for the attainment of a certain age, then you can allocate capital gains to the beneficiary. So suffice to say, you've got lots of opportunities, right? And let me just show you the reason why it's an issue. Again, this is a microscopically sized example here. Um, I heard something agree with that. But the, um, 
what I've got here is dividends, interest, and capital gains, and, and some additional uh, fiduciary fees. At the end of the day, if you were to actually see this in more detail, the trust is going to pay tax on nine, uh, of the hundred thousand of capital gains. It would, take, it would pay tax on ninety-nine thousand seven hundred. It's a small exemption, but it's going to pay tax on basically all the capital gains unless we do something to the justice or allocate to the beneficiary. The rate of tax in this is at 20%. So there's a net investment income tax of 3.8. It's substantially higher than the tax we pay if we were able to allocate it to income beneficiary. All right. All right. And then very briefly, I want to talk about California. California can, has its own set of rules as it relates to trust and how they're taxed. The, uh, for a, a fiduciary estate, a probate estate, if the decedent was a decedent of Cal, was a resident of California, and there's a, there is undistributed net income to the probate estate, it's taxed to California. And what about a trust, a irrevocable trust? Well, California taxes it based on this whole regime of looking first at whether or not the source of income is from California. So we've got California rental property is taxed to California, and then the residency of a trustee. I mean, how often you have trustees? They're non-California residents of a number of them. I've got trustees who are overseas or foreign trustees. The child, the child's the trustee for the parents' bypass trust, and they're not even a resident of, of the U.S. How do we allocate income? Well, California has a set of rules for it. So to the extent that there is income in the trust, we allocate it based on the residency of the trustee. It doesn't seem very intuitive. If you've got an out-of-state trust, but an in-state California, the California in-state trustee, you're supposed to allocate to California. Right? I mean, no one ever does that. Um, and then, uh, um, one other pointer. Well, anyway, it, it, it's based on allocation of, of uh, income to California, allocation based on residency of trustees, oh, then, alloc then allocation based on the residency of the, uh, of the actual beneficiary. We are going to make our time commitment. Our conclusion will be shown based on three examples. They're really going to illustrate, whoops, I don't want to get too far ahead here. So uh, first example, trust document says all income at least annually to X, our beneficiary. Trust has $50,000 in capital gains and $50,000 of interest slash dividends for the year. What income distribution must X receive? Well, read the trust document. We don't know. I can't tell you at this point. We need to see whether there are any special definitions, whether there's a unit trust. And then we also have to look at the expenses and how they might be allocated. So that's not in the, the first part of the facts. We need more information. All gets back to reading the trust document and considering uh, whether there might be overrides. The next example, uh, trust document says to X, all income necessary for X's health, education, maintenance, and support. A HEM standard, we call that. And uh, the, the trustee has seen Dan's slide about DNI trapping and says, I really don't want to have all of this income taxed at the trust level where it's trapped. And, and you've got X and the identified remainder beneficiaries all saying, hey, let's just get that, all that, those funds out to X. X doesn't need the money, but what we'd like to do is have the, the income taxed at X's tax rate rather than the trust tax rate. Is that okay? Well, first off, again, you're asking would beneficiaries complain, and when we ask about beneficiaries, we're not focusing on taxes, we're focusing on beneficiaries broadly. If you're kicking money out of the trust that isn't necessary for the HEM standard, you're violating the trust document, uh, and, and remainder beneficiaries could have causes of action. But think about from a tax perspective. Again, 661 of the Internal Revenue Code says that for trusts that don't have to distribute all their income, at least annually, a distribution has to be properly made. And if it's not properly made because X doesn't need the funds under the HEM standard, doesn't carry out DNI. So the funds may be distributed, it may violate the trust document, and not get you a deduction. That's not a good thing for the lawyers or, or the accountants involved, I would think. Uh, and then the final slide would be uh, what happens if a trustee wants to invest in low yield, but at least until recently, high income potential or, or growth potential securities, uh, but wants to 
treat beneficiaries impartially, what might the trustee do? Well, consider the two things that we talked about. Uh, it could be a, a unit trust, could be in the drafting, which is normally where we'll see it. You can also convert to a unit trust. Again, three to five percent range, default is four. Or consider the adjustment power. Again, it's an ad hoc thing. It's It really should be a year-to-year -year determination. But those are ways in which you can satisfy the trustee's obligations of impartiality and investing for overall return. And with that, I think we've got like three minutes, and I'll turn it back to the boss. Do we have any questions? Kathy. How does having non-California property with income sources and the uh, how does that impact distributions or allocation of income to non-resident beneficiaries? Right. Um, well, the uh, that's a great question. Any other questions? <laughs> 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 well, well, we, we, again, we look at when it comes to trust income taxation. We look at one is it sourced income to California. Well, one is, is the trust retaining income, right? If the answer is no, we're allocating income now, right? And then it depends on if we've got non-California residents that are receiving, that are, let's say, getting a third of the income, why, I'm assuming they're getting income from all sources. So they would have sourced income to California as a, as a result of them getting part of that income from California. Now, to the extent they're getting income from property that's non-California, it's not pulled back into a, a, a California K-1. So they only pay tax on the California source. And I got one other quick, just quick thing. So I've been doing, I've been in public accounting since 1986. Our, my firm does, I don't know, 70 or 80 trust returns a year, and I've worked on those for the last 35 years. How many audits do you think I've gone? Anybody here from the IRS first? <laughs> <laughs> How many audits do you think my firm or firms over the years have had? I've got one guess for zero. Anybody else? <laughs> one. Thank you. I said one, and it's one of my employees. It's one, and I, I, and I probably shouldn't even talk about this. And that was an issue of, of allocating depreciation out on a K-1 that I had to explain to the auditor. Right. So I, now I'm not saying play the audit lottery is how you do tax planning, right? <laughs> <laughs> if it's one in a 2,000 chance, I mean, you're not, if you're gnashing your teeth at $100 deduction, just take it. <laughs> this isn't being recorded, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Typically, uh, you, you can get to the end of the year, that's when you're going to calculate your, your income for the year, right? right. And, and including your taxable income. And, and so, I mean, the tax laws give you, what, 65 days, typically, to... to yeah. other, than, other than with respect to charities that they give you more, uh, to essentially relate, a dis to have a distribution made within that first 65-day period relate to the prior year and carry out DNI. Um, I guess you could have a situation where you have over-distributed income, you're guessing wrong, and you've made distributions. I haven't run into that. I wouldn't want to write that letter asking for the funds back. I would, I would think that a practical solution might be to uh, essentially have a carryover and have an agreement amongst the beneficiaries. That's a, that's a trust accounting income as, as opposed to the tax issue. But yeah, do some kind of an offset. Yeah. Tax 
Well, I don't know. I mean, I dealt with it in the context of multi-state taxation, where you're trying to to, to essentially portion uh, business income or allocate non-business income for business income purposes, not taxation. I, I haven't seen it in the context of trust. At least I haven't run into it. Yeah, I don't have a good answer. Okay, Jeff. 